Hi everybody, Levi Clay here, back again to do another Mandates with Guitar Mates. And the person that we are going to do quite a few videos with, hopefully, in the coming months, is a gentleman that is probably regretting making the suggestion of collaborating now, because you know what YouTube collaborations are like. You're always wanting to uh, work with people that have a slightly bigger reach than you. And when we first started talking, that was exactly the case. He had quite a small YouTube channel, but he went semi-viral, and now his YouTube channel is bigger than mine. Boohoo. This seems to be happening a lot in my life. So uh, a big welcome, everybody, uh, to Ross Trottier. Say hello. Hello. I remember, it's not, it's not the, uh, the size of the boat. It's, it's the motion of the ocean, man. That is true. But based on that alone, then your channel is much better than mine because you post loads of really interesting educational videos. You never, ever speak ill of anybody. There's never any rants. It's a very professional channel. And uh, honestly, anybody watching my channel that is unfamiliar with Ross's work, you should. He, he puts a lot of time into really nice, slick, animated videos that I'm sure you'll all get something out of. So go and check them out. Much appreciated. <laughs> Saying that, the only difference between our channels, evidently, is um, my my home studio and everything I do is run out of, uh, well, yeah, my studio. And I have a nice camera and I have lighting on me and I've got a nice microphone and all of this trickery. More importantly, a nice internet connection. Uh, we're currently yes. watching you and uh, it looks like we're streaming you on old uh, 56K dial-up internet. But such is life, such is life. If you want to see him in full glory, like I say, you should head to his YouTube page. <laughs> so, why don't we talk about, uh, in fact, you know, we know what we're going to talk about, but before we talk about ethics of teaching and things like that, why don't you just tell people your story and who you are, where you're from, and why we're a good match of people to talk to, because we're very different in our in our musical lives. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm primarily, or have been primarily, a classical guitarist. Um, I attended uh, CU Boulder for classical guitar uh, under Jonathan Leithwood, who is just an amazing teacher, um, one of the best classical guitar players out there. Uh, and, you know, I started my musical journey really on a very classical basis. I heard classical guitar played. I said, that's what, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to play classical guitar. Um, and then I immediately purchased a really nice classical guitar and got myself the best teacher money could buy worked to get my auditions done and went to school for it. Um, my teacher at the university actually left mid degree. So I decided to leave school as well and go out, um, and just kind of work and teach and perform a bit. Um, I have gone all the way from being a totally homeless and destitute teacher to having a beautiful classroom here in downtown Colorado Springs and living in a nice house and just, you know, loving every day, teaching my students one by one um, and really focusing on the, the classical guitar until fairly recently where I decided, you know what, there are enough classical guitar players out there, mm -hmm. uh, I think certainly. And it's not really a genre where you go to push the fold. So I've recently uh, <laughs> made a little bit of a, a push towards learning some more popular styles and, and actually reaching out to, to people that play and teach popular styles like yourself so that I can um, learn a little bit more about my own voice. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. My, my YouTube channel is really out there as a really great way um, to give people a step-by-step -step kind of forward momentum from the moment they start playing guitar around right to very beginner friendly channel. If you're uh, somebody that's already really good, you know, maybe my music theory lesson video might help you a bit, but my channel right now is geared more towards beginners that really do need that step-by-step, -step, you know, process rather than sure. just, hey, here's how you play a, an Eagle song. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny that you say that because uh, you, uh, the thing you said there that I picked up on, you said there's enough classical guitar players out there. And your way of dealing with that was, well, you know what? Let's learn some more contemporary styles. There's not enough of them. You, can, you could, you can really contribute a lot to this scene when you play electric guitar. <laughs> Having a unique yeah. selling point, like being a great classical guitar player, certainly isn't going to hurt. <laughs> no, classical guitar is uh, there's there's a lot of discipline, <laughs> mm. lots of discipline in it. 
too much discipline for me back in the day. Uh, I said this to you last time we were chatting, but uh, I'm a nail biter, and that kind of makes <laughs> having good having a good tremolo technique impossible. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it's a habit I've never been able to kick, unfortunately. Um, well, I say unfortunately. I enjoy biting my nails. It's a disgusting habit, and I'm a disgusting human. So why don't we talk about, uh, speaking of disgusting things, let's get talking on the subject of ethics then, because we were talking... Obviously, I've had a lot of traffic on my channel just recently for taking issue with uh, some people's positions on the ethics of teaching and the morality of teaching, what is okay, what is not okay. Um, before we can talk about the, uh, examples, it would probably make sense if we talk about experience, I think. What is your history in terms of education? Where... Uh, you know would you say you're a qualified teacher do you have much experience in learning how to teach yeah absolutely okay um so of course uh, you know you have your 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 university courses you take for pedagogy yeah. um i've i've taken those i've been teaching for about five years and in, in a one-on-one -on -one in person setting uh mostly focusing on finger style and classical guitar i have a, a handful of students that that do play contemporary styles but they're studying with me more for the, the music theory knowledge as well as the, just the practice, practice etiquette you get out of a, a classical style teacher. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my, qual my qualifications are, are, are pretty solid. University trained classical guitarist. Um, I can read music like nobody's business. I know my <laughs> theory very, very well. Um, touched on all of those bases. Uh, my students do very, very well. I teach... Generally, I go between 35 and 40 students a week, depending on who's sick, yep. who's on vacation. Um, and everything that I do, I try to do in a way where either I am somebody that can give you the answer or I am somebody that can find the answer. Yep. And that's, that's what the, the basis that I operate on. Um, and my goal for every single student is one goal and one goal only eventually want them to fire me and feel confident in doing so yeah that's a really good way of looking at it i kind of feel similar in my teaching practices my goal is to put myself out of business as fast as possible as my student it is my job to put you in a position where you no longer need me and i am an effective teacher if i can do that in one lesson <laughs> it's not happened yet but yeah, if a student, but it, well, no, to a degree, it does actually happen. I do have students that come to me. Obviously, I'm not like you. I don't teach forty students a week. I teach. What have I done this week? I don't know. I've I've pushed the boat out and done about ten students this week, which is more than I would normally like to do. But I've been very busy because of my video things. But anyway, what, what I'm getting at is I don't advertise lessons. I don't rely on lessons. People reach out to me for lessons because they want to learn what I do and my approach to things. So they tend to be intermediate to advanced players and yeah it's not uncommon for somebody to come in and have one lesson and then after that they feel that they've got enough that they can go away and they understand and they need to work on things if back in the day when I was working with beginners more regularly that was always the goal it was never I do see people you know working out how you can stay with us keep a student with you for years and years and years and if the student needs that, then absolutely. But if that's your goal when you set out, I want this student to be with me for years. How can I keep them for years and years? Then maybe, maybe you're missing the point of teaching. Maybe there's a bit of an ethical or moral issue going on here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'll throw it out to you. I'll let you, when we talk about morality, before we talk about like being a good teacher, being good morally, being good ethically, what would you then deem to be bad things what what is what are the warning signs of things that you think a lot of teachers miss and a lot of students miss when we talk about the ethics of teaching well the the first thing is you have to have the students goals in mind um there's a lot of teachers out there that want to teach you what they're working on and in guitar that is so it's just insane how common that is you know, the, the first red flag that, that is thrown up, if I were to go, oopsies, if I were to go hiring a teacher again, um, or, you know, I, I take intermittent lessons from people here and there just because I love it. I'll never stop. Yeah. Um, 
the first thing I look for is if if the the teacher is starting the session by it, at the very least asking me a few questions about what I'm doing and what I have done and where I want to go. If if that's not on the table right away, then you may as well assume that you're not really with a teacher. Um, that's first and foremost. Second, they got to be able to play. <laughs> a people, a person, somebody's got to be able to play. I mean, there, there's, well, there's, I've met people that will tell you that that's not the case. I know, you know, I honestly, I had one teacher, um, that I took a few lessons from at a community college. I'll leave it totally unnamed, et cetera. Um, and the guy was teaching guitar at a college and I went in for a classical guitar lesson and he, I don't remember what song it was. He, I think it was La Rumba or, or some, some sort of popular song from the sixties that he, he tried to teach me how to strum along with. And it, it came down to actually going to one of his recitals at the school and he, he played classical guitar one time and it, it sounded, um, I don't know. It sounded much worse than any of his students. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, let's let's dig into that a bit more. So rather than uh, what often happens in my videos, or at least on my Facebook, when when I get into discussions of raging flame wars with people, is someone throws an argument at me, and then I knock it out of the park because that's what I do. I'm just that awesome. No, um, that's <laughs> my style. You know, somebody says something, and I, and I, and I if I disagree with it. I want to rip it apart and I want to explain why you're wrong about something. Let's do it the opposite way here. I will, I will pre present you with some examples um, of where what we've just talked about might be incorrect, where that might not be the case, and see if see what your thoughts on them are. So somebody pointed sure. out that in relation to this idea that a teacher needs to be able to do the thing they're teaching, oh, this is a bad argument. A man, A football manager doesn't need to be able to play football to be a good manager and a good player doesn't necessarily make a good manager what are your thoughts on that i think that's a ridiculous thing <laughs> Why? um well first off um so a man are, are we making a distinction between manager and coach exactly yeah, that was the, exactly my argument yeah a football manager doesn't teach you to play football he manages you. He manages yeah. the team. <laughs> and lots of great players have managers. Yeah. It couldn't yeah. exist without them. Um, yeah. Now, if you're, if you're talking about somebody that, let, let's put this in the context of football, which I know nothing about, and we're probably even thinking about two different games here. So I'm, let me actually think about what, what we would refer to as soccer <laughs> out yeah. here. Uh, so let's say i'm i'm hiring somebody to teach me how how to just dribble a ball or kick a ball across a field um that's how much i know i don't know if it's dribble or kick whatever <laughs> but <laughs> let's say i'm hiring somebody just to teach me how to do that yep. they first need to be able to take the ball and demonstrate it to me they're not going to pull up a youtube video of someone demonstrating it and then reiterate that to me Yep. And I'm not looking for a reference guide on how to blow up a football. I'm looking how, how to kick it. And then not only am I looking at learning how to kick it, but I also need to try to kick it and screw up and have that person actually tell me how I screwed up and be yep. able to demonstrate how I screwed up. Yep. And as a, as a guitar teacher, for example, if you're teaching something to somebody and you hear a rhythm that's wrong, you need to be able to pick up your guitar and play the rhythm wrong and then be able to play it right so you can show yeah. them both what they did wrong and what they did right. Sure. Okay. And you I'll can't even know if they did it right if you can't count the rhythm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. If you don't understand those things, you you can't um, demonstrate it's, it's pointless. But so I think what we're saying is it's not really a case of the, I think the argument, the counter argument that people are trying to make is that you don't need to be a world class player to be a teacher. And I'm sure we'd both agree with that, though, wouldn't we? You don't need to be the best guitar player in the world to teach guitar. You need to fully understand the thing that you are teaching. So not guitar. That's not what you're teaching. I mean, you are teaching guitar. But if you come to a lesson for me and we're looking at fingerstyle blues guitar, I should fully understand every element of fingerstyle blues guitar that we are going to talk about. It's not saying that you have to be a god of playing the instrument to teach. And I, I feel 
almost like actually quite bad for people that watch my content and they feel that that's what I'm saying because you you have to remember it. well maybe you don't know this you definitely know this in the contemporary music world the contemporary electric guitar world there's there's kind of two distinct camps that I don't I'm, I'm being ridiculous here they don't hate each other but you, you have all these metal players on one hand that that think they're better than the other camp because the metal players can play fast and clean and you have the other camp let's call them old blues guys and they look down on anybody that can play fast because those guys don't play with feel it's a ridiculous argument you can you can't be an expert well you can be an expert of both things but the point is you don't need to be a master shredder to teach blues you don't need to be a master blues player to teach shred um type thing and this is i think demonstrated in the second argument that has been presented to me which falls a lot more in line with what you were talking about there and that is when you look at anybody that achieves extremely well in a sport like an olympic swimmer for example you may have an olympic swimmer that has five gold medals six gold medals but their their coach doesn't necessarily need to have six gold medals in order to be able to teach same thing isn't it it's yeah cool but the coach fully understands swimming and how how swimming works the mechanics of swimming they can get in a pool and help you with things like posture (laughs) so yeah yeah And, and there's a certain amount of teaching that is also just keeping people honest you know i would say in in terms of teaching my students um i spend at least let's say 10% of the monthly lessons on talking to them about just their routine and just what are you doing when you pick that thing up? I mean, are you just picking it up and going or is there, (laughs) is there an objective? Um, and being able to keep people on their objective is a, is another role of a coach, but that, that part, is probably a bit of a broader role. You still need the level of expertise to be able to guide somebody to become the best that they, that they want to. Um, and as a teacher, you know, I've got a, I, so I would not be considered an expert finger style blues player. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I do have a, a less up on my channel where I play through a Robert Johnson finger style lick that I read off of some sheet music and I explain how to play it. Um, and I'm not a world class finger style blues, but I'm just not, Yeah. but I can still play it and I can still explain it very well. And then I can also tell a student how to set up their practice session before they play it. Um, and as long as I can deliver on that, then I'm qualified to do it. Yep. As long as I can describe to you what's going on, describe to you how to count it, and then look at you playing it and, and understand whether or not there's there's something you can do better or not, that's that's where it is. The proof is in is in the pudding there. You don't necessarily have to be a you know a, a ex touring artist yeah. for fingerstyle blues to teach a fingerstyle blues sure. lesson. Well like my hope was that we're going to be fully in agreement on everything, and I still feel we are, but I'm going to push a little bit further on what you said there. Sure. Then. So um, what would you do then if somebody, because you didn't really specify your teaching practices, are you just teaching classical guitar players, or do you have some electric? I teach players? just kind of general, whoever comes in, and I help okay. them with whatever it is that I can help them with. Okay. What would you do if somebody came to you and they wanted to learn to play fingerstyle um, acoustic guitar, fingerstyle blues? Well, first off, I would explain, A, I'm not the best finger st- I'm not the best blues guitarist in the world. There you go. You win. I'll take the fingerstyle <laughs> out of there. So yeah. with, with my classical playing, there's not a lot fingerstyle that I can't learn to do, you know, within a handful of days. Um, given preparation time. So if I had somebody coming in looking for fingerstyle blues lessons, the first thing that I would do is I'd ask myself, is this something that I have time for? Because that's a student that I'm going to be doing extra homework for. Wow. If I'm going to teach them fingerstyle blues, then I'm going to tell them which book we're going through. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be able to play everything before they can. Um, I am not in that position right now. So the likeliest scenario right there is I would refer them to somebody else. And that um, is, uh, that's amazing. Like it takes, 
a consummate professional to be comfortable to do that. I've done that this week. I had a guy approach me wanting to learn, wanting to develop his technique. He was a very good metal player. And we did end up doing um, a lesson this week and we'll hook up again soon. But what he wanted to work on was his alternate picking technique. And I had to get right to the point of it and say, look, if you want to get better at alternate picking, I'm not the guy to help you with that. I can point you in the direction of several great teachers for that very specific thing. And I can point you at lots of resources that will be you know, a good use of your time. But even then, you can't trust me on those resources being good resources because they clearly haven't worked for me. My alternate picking is not where I feel it should be in order for me to be sat here taking your money to teach you how to do it. What I can teach you is this, 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 and this. If you want to work on, I don't know, um, fretboard visualization and, and creative ways of combining arpeggios and strings whatever it is you know i'm sure there's lots we can do but that one thing that you are very specific about wanting to learn that's not that's not me so in these conversations that i've had with supporters of a certain gentleman um <laughs> i asked this question that that same question what would you do if somebody came to you and they asked to learn finger style country or whatever the, the way I see it is there's only three answers to the question. Answer one, and I think this is probably what they would do, answer one is to convince them that the thing that they want to learn isn't really what they want to learn. That's a way of getting around <laughs> it, isn't it? Yeah, if somebody asks you, oh, I'd like to play like Chet Atkins, you just convince them why they don't want to waste their time learning to play like Chet Atkins. You and I both know that there are teachers out there that would do that. Anybody oh, yeah. watching this knows there are teachers out there that would do that. And that is morally and ethically questionable because you're not addressing your students needs you're addressing your bank accounts needs the second way that they might deal with it is not perfect and i think it to a degree it's what you and i uh, just talked about there it's this idea of just staying a couple of lessons ahead of the student just make sure that you're you're able to do the things that they need to do that inherently will run into some sort of problems though because as you say you know can you devote the time there may come a time where you can no longer devote that time there also may come a time where you might realize that you've gone down a path and hit a wall at the end of that path and actually the way to correct that is to go back several steps and to fix something and, and move forward so i'm not saying that that's inherently wrong i'm saying it's risky <laughs> and the third yeah, option it's, is it's the also... sensible one it's a battle you have to choose too. Yeah. You know, for me, if somebody came in saying I'd like to learn fingerstyle guitar and I had time to devote to that, I have no question in my mind that I can bring them down a path leading them to where they need to go. But if they were to say I want to learn to play like super awesome hot rock blues on my electric guitar and like that's not a battle I'm like no, I that yeah. I can refer you to somebody else. That's something where I could very well lead you down a path that may not bring you to where you want to go. So it is also like you could kind of there's there, there's little bits of music education where there's other bits that are very related to it. And, and you can you have an easier time going into that, mm -hmm. um, whereas other parts, you know, I, I would would never even dream of hiring a conductor to teach me how to play metal guitar. <laughs> you know, well, that, that suggests that conductors aren't all metal because i thought it was well established that all conductors are great metal players that's Have true I been misled there <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah or the, and the third is the one we talked about which is just refer the student to somebody that's better suited for their needs and if you're scared of doing that if you're not willing to do that then i feel that there's a an ethical issue with your teaching you're not concerned about the student's needs you're concerned about your own needs and anybody that's in that position, you found yourself in that position, I would just like to encourage you to think about this in a logical way. If you're the best at what you do, it's okay to refer people to other teachers for the thing that you're not great at because you would imagine that people are going to get referred to you for the thing that you're great at. And then you end up in this wonderful position where all of your students that are with you are with you to study the thing that you are a master of. I can't imagine yeah. the stress that I would have to go through pretending that i can teach classical guitar i feel that i don't have these big moral and ethical dilemmas in my teaching because i'm willing to be honest with a student there are a bunch of subjects that i would not even consider touching with a student and one of them is classical guitar and to be honest of of all of my musical experience i've probably had more private instruction on classical guitar than anything else 
but I still wouldn't sit here and tell you that I can teach classical guitar because it's just not I'd be being dishonest if that were the case so I would like to avoid ever doing that um yeah I'm sure it's the same with you you must have a, a bunch of things that you wouldn't be willing to teach yeah um and you know what one thing one way that I learned this was actually I taught a couple kids cello for a little while because I just I play it because I enjoy it yeah I've received like two lessons on it in my life um I I know music theory and I know what good intonation sounds like sure but I'm using I'm using guitar technique on the thing um and I I was teaching a couple kids cello for a little while and I realized you know what uh this isn't like this isn't doing them very very much in terms of favors so I ended up referring them on to someone else and you know one of the things that I've noticed about it is, that I think really has to be talked about especially with this emerging kind of educational pie on the internet is the idea that there's only like 15 slices of pie for everybody um the pie's getting bigger everyone <laughs> like there's lots of pie for everybody yeah. Um, and you're going to end up with, with one of two scenarios, either you're very honest with what you can do and what, what you can show people, and you're going to end up having credibility and you're going to eventually be, um, a source of just credibility for your community. You're going to be somebody that people look to, to, to actually, yeah, exactly. You're, you're <laughs> going to be. You're going to be somebody that somebody at the very least feels comfortable asking a question to. Or you're going to end up in another scenario. And this is – so I, I had never really heard of Tom Hess before I looked at um, some caged I'm, I'm stuff. Have to bleep that That's out. how I discovered – yeah, right? I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll call him Tom. Yeah. He who, um, he who shall not be named. <laughs> I saw one of his videos. Uh, I don't know if it was on his YouTube channel, but there was one of his videos where – He's sitting down to give a blues lesson to a guy. And he's got his metal guitar in his hand. And he goes to play the first note, and the note screams. Yeah. Metal, it's like it, he's got his he's got like three or four distortion pedals yeah, on yeah. the thing. With the heavy metal vibrato and yeah. And where was this isn't even blues right from the very first yeah. note. And and you're gonna end up with videos like that out or or content well, like the, that. This isn't somebody that a fan uploaded, something that a fan uploaded. This is something that he who shall not be named, videoed, and then went, you know what, let's put that one up. Yeah, and you know? it sounded What awful. are the ones that didn't get put up? <laughs> you have yeah. to be good. Like, um, you, you teach classical guitar. That's your, well, you teach music and guitar, but your field of expertise is classical guitar. Do you feel that there are elements of classical guitar that you wouldn't be comfortable, you wouldn't feel confident teaching? The example that pops into my mind, just because um, I've been watching a, a reasonable amount of it on YouTube in the last month or so, is have you watched all of these Russian classical guitarists, the guys that play those seven strings in a weird tuning? No, no. I'm going to have to check that out. Exactly. So after this, I'm going to send you a bunch of videos. And I did, like I say, I, uh, same as you, I've been playing classical guitar for, a, a, well, I've not played in a long time, but I have a history in that thing that as an instrument and it wasn't until my friend Doug Cartwright introduced me was it Doug that introduced me to them it may have been introduced me to these Russian classical guitar players and apparently it's just a it's the instrument they play over there it looks like our classical guitars only they have seven strings and they're tuned in a very weird kind of open tuning that doesn't give them the same range that our seven strings have but it enables them to do things that we can't do and watching them play and listening to them them play it's mind-bending the things that they're capable of pulling off and the reason i picked that is because I, I imagine that if a student came in and showed you a video and said i'd like to play like this it would be a similar thing to if a student comes into me with a seven string and says i want to learn to play gent i have to just say i can't i can't help you there <laughs> <laughs> that's okay you're allowed to to be in that position um yeah so should we should we get onto the um ethical and moral mother load yeah, or at least what I it. deem to be the ethical and moral mother load. So I make the assumption that you saw a post about another he who should not be named on my um, Facebook that went semi-viral. It was this idea of treating your students like they're employees, like they can't they can't betray you. you. You're not allowed to have lessons with other teachers, and I found out that you're having lessons 
with other teachers in a band setting but i don't offer band sessions but you're not allowed to have band sessions with those guys and then the post in question the the teacher in question clearly demonstrated that they have actually actually some quite dark motives towards that student um, even going so far as lying to the parents who are actually concerned about the relationship that's developing between the two um, that's getting into a whole a whole side of teaching that <laughs> uh, and the ethics of teaching that just the problem with contemporary electric guitar as a teaching thing is it's it's very easy to do lots of people want to play the electric guitar therefore guitar players that can play well tend to go into the teaching world and they don't think about some of the more ethical side of things like child protection which is very very important when we're talking about this this post in question we're talking about a student who at the time was 17 years old um so i guess actually depending on what country you're in or what state you're in in some places would be considered a minor in other places maybe not uh over here i believe yeah would be considered a minor so yeah protection child protection and elements like that. What are your thoughts on that in regards to teaching? You know, that that responsibility lies 100% in the teacher's lap. Um, and it is a, not a small subject. Oh, no. And as First a teacher, off, you do not want a child on your lap. Don't do it. No. You'll get in trouble. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, I mean, there, there's... There's even parts like you, you know, you really have to af actually even ask a kid if you can touch their hands while they're on the, the fretboard before you yeah. even, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind as far as that goes as, for teaching. If yeah. you're teaching anybody on an online setting, 18 years or older, I don't care. Really? 18 years or older. So I'd not actually considered that and I can kind of see why you might say something like that. Yeah. And I teach kids in person, but their parents pay me. And their parents are sitting out in my hallway when I'm teaching them. And my office is here, and it's an a office building. Like, this is a professional environment. My house is three miles up the road. Right. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a setting where parents know they can come in. Their kids are safe. They're going to see their kids in a half hour. Um, I mean, there's... There are so many concerns with that. Um, another thing that, that has to do with teaching kids specifically is you you stick to the subject that you're teaching. You know, I've I've had a couple students ask me about college um, and about what they should do because they've considered going for music or, or what have you. Yeah. Or they've just asked me, but they've been about 18 and I give them my my real opinion on it if they've asked for it. That is a much de different thing than pushing your students down a philosophical road that leads to them giving you more money. Mm, yeah. Yes. Um, or, well, in this case, it wasn't actually about giving, it was them earning money for you. And the beauty of that is you can dress it up as, I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you work here. No, you're making money. Um, yeah, so I, I'll just jump back and I'll just talk briefly about the thing you mentioned there, uh, because with your teaching business, is it is it your business? Are you teaching privately or do you teach in a like a I, school type? Hundred percent me. Hundred okay, percent so, me. So you talked about um, touching, putting your hands on a student, and you said you, you have to ask type thing. You're absolutely right. Of course, you're absolutely right. Um, over here, it's it's even harder actually because while that's obviously the case, you should always ask. Um, I've yet to ever see a school that even allows that as a policy. Most schools over here now very much have the policy of under no circumstances are you ever to lay your fingers on a student if you're if you're teaching them. And I find that actually quite problematic with sure. our instrument. It's very difficult yeah. to help someone correct their posture without helping them correct their posture, even if that's just lifting the elbow up to keep the wrist straighter. And they and they they keep dropping down, and you might need to just tap the wrist and say, "Remember, keep your keep your wrist up like." I'm trying to stay on camera here. Keep your wrist up like this. Um, yeah. That not being able to do that was a, a big concern for me when I was at university, and we were uh, I did a, a licentiate in music teaching as well as my uh, degree in performance. So, I being told that I hated that actually as an idea. 
I understood it. I understood that actually really what it was for was for my protection. It was for the school's protection. And then you go down this kind of dangerous route when you think about the logical extreme here. And what is happening is you're being protected from ever finding yourself in a position where you're accused of something that you've not done. It's it's very easy to touch a student and help them correct their posture and that maybe be misinterpreted by the student, especially students of a certain age you'd never want to find yourself in that position um but at the same time the opposite that it's all oh, hello siri what are you beeping for it's also possible for it to be more malicious than that there are definitely examples of kids making accusations that are baseless towards teachers it has happened troubled kids sometimes say things that aren't true Maybe they're having issues at home. Whatever the issues are, it's never it's never uh, acceptable. It's never understandable, but it does happen. And therefore, this you're not allowed to ever touch a student is a good thing to have in place because then when the issue is raised, it can be said that the school's policy is that children are never even touched, let alone molested. Um, I've seen schools where their policy is you ha- or, or the door has to be, always be open at any time. It was actually the same when I was in college. I had to have my when I was having my classical guitar lessons, the door had to be open, and I found all of these things quite restrictive to a yeah. teacher, and not massively beneficial to the student. But that's kind of the society we live in, and we're talking about the ethics and morality of teaching. These are things that all need to to be considered. When you get onto that second point, when you start talking about pushing ideology on students, that for me is the biggest no-no i could ever imagine when you talk about recommending college for students it's all about the age right it's all about yeah. how old the student is when they ask you the question if i'm in a room with a, a 12 year old and he asks me about i don't know what would a 12 year old ask me about even even if it's something as simple as uh, I, I don't know what your education system over there is like but we it's uh, primary school and high school over here. It's actually not now. I'm in Scotland. I don't know what the education system is here. Um, but you, there comes a point in your education where you get to pick some of the subjects that you're working on. If a 12-year-old said to me, I'm thinking about doing music, what do you think? I would try to actually avoid the question until I can have that conversation with his parents, his or her parents, because it's incredibly important to me to know what I can and can't say what I am and am not allowed to say. I would never make comments about my religious views to a student. Um, I actually got talking with one guy who he posted a status on Facebook saying, I can't remember who it was now, but he posted a status on Facebook saying that he'd just taken on a new student and the parents are both very strict Christians, which is fine. I have no issue with that. But he had been expressed, he'd been told by the parents that you are only allowed to teach my child Christian rock songs, Christian metal songs. Now, what would you, what would you do in a scenario like that? Well, <clears throat> first off, I don't teach Christian metal songs. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, if it comes down to I can only teach Christian metal songs, then then I know exactly who to refer them to. Um, Do you? If I have parents telling me exactly what to teach, it has nothing to do with whether or not I agree with their religion, but it also, like, I have other concerns as a teacher. Um, For example, having pieces that lead somebody step by step to getting better, Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're limiting the repertoire, that kind of gets in the way. So for me, it's I'm happy to talk to the parents about finding things that are at the very least neutral and yep. sticking to those. But if it's this is what I want you to teach my kid in terms of this is the material I want you to teach, oh. then at that point I just or even this is the material you're not allowed to teach. Because if you're working on a student, working with a student on things like time signatures, you're, and then yeah. you, need, you need a good example of seven eight being used in a song, but you're not allowed to reference any bands that aren't openly Christian bands. That presents a problem. Yeah, because I've only to put in else. an inordinate amount of time in order to find some an example, um, or 
I can't present them with the example. So that's difficult. I, I kind of went off track with that because it isn't really massively relevant to what we were talking about. I had a, a better example in mind. So a good friend of mine uh, used to teach in the kind of traveling music services type thing, local councils. You get sent out to schools to teach. Uh, it's a good way to teach. And he got sent out to a Catholic girls' school and was teaching a, a young Catholic girls' school that was having... She she must have been 16, I would imagine, 15, 16. And she was having a full-on crisis of faith. And that, and she would try and talk to, to my friend about it. And that is the very definition of a dilemma as a teacher. There's what you want to do. You, you kind of want to help them. You want to give them advice and tell them what you think. But then you also have to remember that there come there's a line that shouldn't be crossed. And when it's ideology when it's beliefs and things like that it's not your job as a music teacher to talk about that with someone if they're if they're 25 and they're asking you these questions then fair enough you can talk sure. about whatever you like in lessons if they're paying you but when you're in a school or a parent has brought their kid to you it's not your job to plant seeds in their in their mind of how they'll be thinking a few years from now don't make your students read Ayn Rand it's not a good idea well, yeah. And, you know, one of the things about I mean, it this comes all the way to the basics of being a teacher. You're not telling people what to think. You're telling them and guiding them on how to approach information. At the end, what they think and what they do. That's up to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not your job as a teacher to. I mean, even even in subjects of music, I have sometimes I have students coming in and, you know, for example, they'll they'll talk about, uh, you know, some YouTube video they saw about how some new special way to hold your right hand for classical guitar. Right. Or just something like that. Um, I don't even see it as my job to tell them whether or not they should believe in that video. My, my job is to discuss it with them and discover merit if there is merit and discover, discover demerit if there is that too. And then, you know, let's put it on the table. I'm going to probably go home with my opinion and it does not need to match the student's opinion. Um, really wise it, way of looking at that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just you're, you're helping them process information, but you don't process it for them. Because then you're not teaching them. You're just, it's like, you're I, I mean, I programming train my, them. yeah, I, I train my dog. I teach my students. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a, a good way of looking at things. And it really gets to, to my mind what the, the crux of this teaching ethics is about. I think it's about people just losing track of what your job as a teacher is to actually do. Um, and taking into consideration, I hope people that have watched this have taken into consideration things like child protection, things that they might not have considered before. Um, I was uh, actually told that it's important to, you know, try and get to know your students in a in their mannerisms. So if they're behaving odd one day, you know, you can be a point of call to be the first person that notices that maybe this kid's having problems at home. Maybe this kid's been being abused at home. As a teacher, when you're in charge of minors, that's one of the things that you need to take into consideration. You might be one of this, this kid's only points of call with the outside world. So if they're usually really quite bubbly and happy and then they come into class one day and they don't really want to talk and, they've, and they're wearing long sleeves... You know, there could be an issue where there are bruises under those sleeves. <laughs> Luckily, I can edit that out. So, um, yeah, it's not your job to rip their sleeves up and see what's going on. But, or make assumptions, of course. But just, you, it, you're you looking after these people when, it, when you're dealing yeah. with a minor. And it is your job to do that, exactly that. Look after them. Be there for them. How do you feel about um, making friends with your students? Every single one of my students is, I consider them a friend. Yeah. Even the little kids. I, f I find this hard. So I'm exactly the same. But many of my teacher friends have a very strict, never, that can never be the policy. I've got many of my teacher friends that 
absolutely under no circumstances refuse to have their students on Facebook. In fact, I have teacher friends that have different names on Facebook so their students can't find them. I can see the merit of that. Me too. <laughs> because it does, I mean, um, it, it can sometimes create an idea of a relationship that shouldn't be there. You don't want your students to forget the fact that there is this student-teacher relationship. I come for a lesson, you're my teacher and I look up to you. It's very easy if you see each other on social media too often that you start they start to see you as a friend a peer yeah, um, but yeah you know like I say, that's there is a I line there is a line i mean in terms of considering my students friends like i don't i don't like send them text messages and stuff just to say hey what's up <laughs> that would be kind of <laughs> weird uh but i i always like to talk to them you know sometimes when the kids come in and I'm specifically the kids, you know, the students that are young, you know, they're sometimes they're nervous and sometimes you got to ask them about school and mm -hmm. sometimes you got to ask them about how their day's going and you got to ease into it and you melt the ice a little bit and, and then they kind of forget that they're in front of a teacher and they can actually like their hands aren't shaking when they're playing. Sure. Um, and, you know, there, there's a, I think there's a I think that there is a very practical use to befriending your students, but I, I, I would caution any teacher to cross the line of, you know, hanging out with your students. <laughs> um, I had a college professor, one of my music theory professors, the guy was, he was he's such a cool teacher, a great composer. His name's Carter Pan. And I remember he had an end of semester, like blowout party at his <laughs> house with a bunch of college kids at the end of the semester. <laughs> I didn't go because I'm I'm basically a hermit. Like I just, I'm not I'm not way That's into what guitarists going. Do. Yeah, I was kind of like, uh, <laughs> just, I'm gonna put my hood on and we'll go down in the dungeon again. Yeah. Um, hey, Levi, what's the weather I, like outside? I don't know. I've not been outside in four days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I I thought I was kind of strange of him, and I don't think he had any blowback from it. I I don't necessarily have a rule with Facebook friending mm -hmm. students. If they friend me, like there are some posts that I put on my own Facebook wall that people might disagree with politically. And if they want to end the student teacher relationship because of that, then that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, because that to me is like, you know, if you want to be my Facebook friend and all of that, cool. But, you know, I'm your teacher because of who, you know, what I'm providing for you in terms of sure. education. And if you end that relationship, that's cool because honestly, like, I'm in, I'm not in a position where I have to act like Gollum in the one ring with my students. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have plenty of students and I have so much good word of mouth that I don't advertise. Yep. And my YouTube channel alone, I have enough students waiting in, in there, enough people. I've had to close my Skype lessons off. Now, I'm booked. So if somebody wants to say, you know, I'm I'm fairly libertarian in my leanings. Somebody mm -hmm. goes to my Facebook page and says, "Da da 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 da, I have this." That's cool. I probably won't respond to a student, but if they want to end the student-teacher relationship over that, that's also cool. Like I'm not looking to live a life of secrecy and stress here. Yeah. I'm just looking to teach music, and then if I express myself in other venues mm -hmm. in certain ways you find that unsavory then then that's okay there there are other teachers out there yeah that's um i've experienced kind of both sides of this ups and downs there are some people that some of my students that have become some of my best friends uh and there comes a point where you have to be objective about the situation and say i feel that our student teacher relationship is over here i can't in good conscience keep coming to your house and taking money from you if you wanna, if you want me to come over, you know, we'll come, I'll come over and we'll do what we're doing now. We'll drink whiskey, and we'll listen to music and we'll talk about life and stuff like that. And if you want to ask me some guitar questions and we can just play and have a jam, that's awesome. But it doesn't feel right taking money from you at this point. Then again, I don't see an issue with that because you're you're doing the ethical thing. Like you're you're making sure that you understand what a student is. And on the flip side, I've also had students who. You know, maybe they've picked up my album 
um, Hellcat Molly's Out of the Ashes. Everybody should listen to it. It's awesome. The first song on it is a song called Whiskey and Heresy. And it's a big kind of angry anti-theist song. And yeah, that's... I can't hide the fact that that's the first song on my album. And I had yeah. one of my students reach out to me via Facebook um, and they sent me a link to a bunch of Christian websites and they told me that how I needed to come to Jesus and all of that. And instantly it was very much a case of our our business, our relationship as a student and teacher is now has to come to an end because it's not relevant to, to what we do as yeah. as a teacher. So yeah, there are ups and downsides to befriending your... Um, your students i might want to There's, warn you against it but <laughs> yeah and that, that makes me think of something too so here's here's something that i think a lot of teachers probably should think about and i, I think this is something obviously you have thought about and i know i've thought of it both of us have best-selling books on amazon we do i know that to be the fact <laughs> and there is a nice paycheck that comes with that yeah um maybe not the best part of the world but it, it is it is another form of income so as a teacher like if you want to make money on education, which is like you have to make money on it, otherwise you don't have enough time to spend on it to make it meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have to think about where else is your money going to come from than just your students. You know, there's there's other ways to bring in money so that you can be more lenient and more comfortable in terms of choosing who you teach. Um, if you have somebody coming in for lessons, let's say you're you're a teacher and you it's nothing but students that get you, you get you cash and it's summertime so people are off on vacation and you just need an extra like you need an extra some extra money because, you know, whatever, you might not you might miss a meal or something. And I know I've been in that position. Yep. Um you 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 don't want to have a student come in and say, "Hey, this is the, the like I want to hire you as my teacher, but here's how the relationship's going to work. And I want like I want access to your Facebook. I want to make sure that I vet who you are and all of this. Da 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 da. Or let's just say there's somebody coming in asking for you to teach them something they don't that you don't particularly know well. Right? I mean, it, this can cover a number of students. If you have another form of income, you can actually comfortably say, maybe I'm not the best person. Maybe I'm not the best match for you. Yep. Um, and be able to do it without, hey, worrying about whether or not there's going to be a pork chop in your future. <laughs> um, a pork chop now, damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it's it's very simple. As a teacher, you have to look at not just the time that you have one on one with your students, but just how you set up your overall income so that you're able to make decisions not based off of whether or not you're going to get this extra chunk of pay. Hmm. Yeah, um, that seems to be something I keep coming back to in all of these discussions with people online. It's making, are you making your decisions based on the best interests of your students or are you making in decisions based on your wallet? If you're making decisions based on your wallet, you're losing the reason that you, well, maybe not the reason you started teaching, you're losing the reason you should be teaching. Teaching for me is not a paycheck. If I wanted to just earn money, if I were to just be financially successful, I probably wouldn't have been a musician. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this was a conscious decision. I decided yeah. this. I knew that going into this would not mean as much money as, say, if I'd continued down the road of becoming a dentist or something. I probably have a lot more PRS guitars if I was a dentist. And of course, there's nothing wrong with going down that path. What I'm getting at is if you go down this route, you're not owed a career. You're not owed money. T- trying to tie your students in for you know, as long a term as possible, making them sign contracts and things. Uh, you've paid for eight lessons, so that's it. It's not working out for you after two lessons, but I'm sorry, there's no there's no refunds kind of thing. I can see why businesses have to enact policies like that but there has to be a human element in this a student has come to you they've paid for eight lessons they've had two lessons but they don't gel with you personally like it's not a a good relationship Uh, they don't feel that they're getting what they wanted out of the deal you should really have no qualms refunding them their money 
if not all of the money yeah. that they they're owed, then at least some of it, kind of thing. And I see guys they make make it as difficult as possible. You know, if you want to cancel your relationship with like like it's a gym, if you want to cancel your relationship with us, it has to be a handwritten letter, but it has to be delivered in person, kind of thing. What's that yeah. all about? You know, it should it shouldn't be that. These people, sure, they pay, they give you money, and you rely on their income. <laughs> But the way of not worrying about them leaving is to provide the best service possible, not and to work out how you can tie them down so they can't leave. Yeah, and you got to make sure that you can help the people you're signing on. So the way I set my business model up, I think it's a really good way that I set it up. And I, I'm, I'm the only person I know of that does it this way, at least exactly this way. But um, I do the first lesson free, not so much for for the student, it's actually for me, so that I can say no without taking money from them. And if we both sit down and decide that it's a good fit, I'm a subscription model. Mm -hmm. I don't do a per lesson thing. It's, it's, a, it's a reoccurring billing per month and you get X amount of sessions per month. And if you miss a session in the month, it rolls over to the next one and my system keeps track of it and they can just cancel whenever they want. Um, and then they, they just keep all the credits. But I, I don't get them signed up into that reoccurring model until I sit down with them for an entire hour and we talk about their goals, what they want to do, and whether or not we're even a good fit. Hmm. Um, and sometimes I turn people away because, quite frankly, I don't – like they walk into the practice room and their attitude's kind of like, so how long is this going to take? It's like, okay, you've missed yeah. the point. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to take 30 you. seconds. We've had those 30 seconds. You may now leave. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to darken my door again. The summer. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. well, it's just a summer project. Like, ah, you know, I, I try to be very, very like upfront with my students. When they come in the door, they have to be prepared for the long run, especially if they've never played before. Like, I mean, what is the first two years of guitar are just a lot of hope. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. the first couple years are rough. Yeah. Um, and if you put good time into it, you'll get there. But you know, if I have students coming in wanting to shred by next week, I I have a there's a place down the road I refer all my my <laughs> students that I don't want to teach to. Um, so I I'll refer them. Um, if there's somebody I feel like I can't really help, then I'll refer them as well. And you know, most of the students that come in, it turns out I can help them because a lot of them are looking to do folk finger picking and teaching to write chord progressions and finger pick through those chord progressions for a classical guitar player is like, I mean, I can, I can do that literally while I'm sleeping. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, you do so many exercises of that every day for 10 years as a classical guitar player finger picking through chord progressions, yeah. you know, coming up with a five to eight chord progression for a folk singer and helping them implement it into their practice doesn't turn out to be really hard. And that's a lot of what people do out here in Colorado. Yeah. Um, so most of the people I can help, but the first lesson I set it up for free because I don't know whether or not a, I can help them or even B if I want to. It's a nice um, position to be in, isn't it? When you can turn people away. Yeah, and and the thing is, is it's also good for them too because, you know, if, I'm if not going to turn them away. There's a reason for that. Yeah, and if you show up to a lesson and you're half-hearted about it, how many things are you going to correct? Yeah, you know, it's kind of like, oh, this person's come in, and I don't really like these lessons, so I'm going to just turn the metronome on and kick back. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work <laughs> too well. That way. You have to be passionate about seeing that student and there might be really weird reasons why you might not feel that it's a good fit. Maybe you have a policy where you don't teach people with the name Alan. That, that it doesn't matter the what the are. reason is. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's I, any kind of conflict, but a conflict of interest between that, that primary goal, which is helping them to learn the things that they want to learn, then send them somewhere else. So I'm going to pass it over yes. to you now and ask you to summarize this conversation, um, the things that you feel we've talked about, just so people can think about them and get involved in your comments and my comments, because I'm sure this will go up in both places. 
Ugh, it's a bug. Sure. Let me give you two separate summaries. Okay. Um, let me give you first a summary for, for somebody that isn't a professional guitar player or teacher and what they should take away from this conversation and, and what they should look for if they're hiring a teacher. Um, first off, you need, to, you need to find a teacher that when you walk in a room with them, you don't feel guilty, you don't feel stressed, and you don't feel like they're sitting their thumb in their nose at you. And there's somebody that has outwardly expressed interests in your goals. That is the bottom line. When you're looking for a teacher, it, it hardly gets more important than that. I mean, other than the fact that they need to be able to play, too. And teachers, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, please, play for your students every once in a while. Just do it. <laughs> they Inspire like it. Them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's they part of your job. They need to know what they're working towards. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, play for them. Um, now, for, for teachers, I think this is a really good conversation for anybody that's aspiring to be a teacher or already is a teacher that needs more business, et cetera, et cetera. You really need to start looking at what your strengths are and playing to that. And if you have weaknesses, like all of us do, then start practicing to improve those weaknesses before you start offering to help others with it. For example, I'm learning percussive guitar. I don't have any percussive guitar lessons out there. It's a new thing for me. <laughs> and not being born of Zeus's seed, I have to take time to learn it. Yeah. Right? So there's that. Two, the pie is very big and it's growing. So if you focus on your strengths, people will gravitate towards you. Focus on your strengths and be very honest about your strengths and your weaknesses. The pie is growing. And as this revolution in education, which we're seeing right now, plays through, we need good teachers on the other end, not bad teachers that are good marketing like the nameless one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just elaborate don't need on that. When you, when you said the pie is big like it's huge and it's growing the pie is infinite yeah, the pie is really infinite people pick up the if you if you specialize in teaching beginners people pick up the guitar every single day people quit the guitar every single day but the point is there's always more pie being made and the the weird thing i wish this wasn't the case but this is very definitely the case you know if you write books or do instructional dvds you make products the pie or the customer, shall we say, doesn't rely on just one product. Like when somebody buys my book, they're not a lost customer for you. You can still market to that person because guess what? I've probably got a hundred books on various aspects of jazz improvisation and I'll keep buying more and I've got tons of videos and the same with blues, the same with every genre that I play and I'm still a market for those people. If you've got great jazz guitar lessons, a great jazz guitar product, let me know about it because I'm going to buy it kind of thing. So this pie, yeah. is, it really is infinite. Maybe not so much for teaching privately, but if you go down that route of you're a good teacher and you can write and you end up writing a book or two, that's okay. People that write books, also write books, aren't, I mean, they are your competition, but they're not your enemies. <laughs> no. That, was gonna bring me, that brings me right into the last point I wanted to make. God. So you're a teacher, and I'm a teacher. And we're not wolves at each other's throats. Yeah. We're, Until you take my students, and then I'll come after you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and one, of the, one, of the, one of the most important things for a teacher to be able to do is to talk to other teachers. Um, I have a, a, a few friends up in Denver that I go – jam with from from music school and we have our jam sessions last about an hour and a half and then we sit around for about an hour and a half talking either about music or teaching music and i learn a lot just from hearing how they teach hearing about stories with them and their students collaborating with other teachers getting yourself out there and and most importantly know your like set up a network and know it so that when it does come time for you to refer somebody you have someone to refer them to and it's fairly likely that you'll get the same kind of love back. Yep. Um, I've said this in videos Maybe not before. in the short term, but in the long, yeah, the long term, it's, it's, a, it's a big pie. 
We're all hungry. Let everybody eat. I'm always hungry. I'm really- Me too. I could do with some food. I could always do with some food. I could actually probably do without food for a good couple of months, but I'm going to have some food. Um, yeah, so Ross, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, doing more of these, talking about learning different subjects and things. And I'm sure that your subscribers will enjoy it and my subscribers will enjoy it and all of that good stuff. So as this is going to be in both places... Uh, it seems silly to tell everybody to go over to you and check out your channel because they might be there. But I'm going to do it anyway. So if you're watching this video on my channel, you can head on over to Ross's channel. There will be a link to that at the very end of this video. uh, And I'll put it in the description. And likewise, if you are on Ross's channel and you would like to come and check out some of the inflammatory content that I make, you can also do that. You're more than welcome to do that. Obviously, we both offer Skype lessons. We're both very busy. So you can hit us both up for Skype lessons and we're probably going to say, I'm too busy right now. But, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you find a teacher that has a lot of students and they can't always take on new students at the drop of a hat, it might mean that you've, you're onto something. You might have found somebody that's kind of good. If you're battling right. to get into their schedule every week, um, that, that's good. I mean, I'll, I'll do my best to try and fit people in and I'm sure it's the same with you. But yeah, I'm not going to overstretch myself, get myself to the point where I can't devote the right amount of time to, to what you need to do and what you need to learn. Anyway, I'm rambling. That's kind of what I do. So <laughs> one more time. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Ross, for doing this. Um, any messages, Any anything you'd like to say? No, I mean, check out the channels and thanks for having me. Cool. Well, right now on screen... Up in the uh, top left, you will see a link to Ross's channel. In the bottom left, you will see a link to my channel. Over my face right now, you will see a link to one of my videos. And below where my face used to be, you will see a link to one of Ross's videos. Go and check him out. He's a good guy. He's a more famous YouTuber than I am now. So, um, yeah, he must be doing something right. Peace out, and uh, we'll see you for another video soon. Bye.